Braden is co-founder of Designing the We. He will talk about the exhibit as a whole, why it was created, and what a visitor can expect from the experience. Next, Elizabeth Richards, Erica Anthony, and Devante Dickey will talk about their story hosting the exhibit in Cleveland, one of the earliest cities in this round. Wrapping up the panel will be Katie McKenna and Rowena Alegria to share their experiences hosting and interacting with the exhibit while it was in Denver. Each of these cities, in each of these cities, you will learn they took a unique approach to developing the local components of the exhibit. This makes sure no two exhibits are exactly alike and that they, that they tell the story of where they are located. Before handing things over to Braden, I wanted to share a little bit of background on Opportunity 360 and how it ties into the Undesign the Redline exhibits. In 2017, Enterprise Community Partners launched Opportunity 360 as a way to begin to measure opportunity in communities we partner with. In early conversations, we realized there are common lessons learned that can be applied to the field of community development. Opportunity outcomes are the results of our work in communities throughout the country. Outcomes are what makes our work meaningful and how we measure progress towards success. Enterprise leveraged our collective experience and expertise, along with a review of the existing landscape of opportunity measurement in creating these outcome areas. We ultimately developed five outcomes as part of our opportunity framework. Those five are housing stability, education, health and well-being, economic security, and mobility. For each of the cities that enterprise-sponsored exhibit, exhibits, our team created maps that overlaid the historic redlining maps on top of these opportunity outcomes. The results facilitate a conversation about the connection of redlining in the early 20th century to the current condition of neighborhoods. Here is an example of a map created for Cuyahoga County where Cleveland is located. You can download a full set of maps from the resources section of Opportunity 360. In this map, the orange layer represents the Opportunity 360 housing stability outcome divided into quintiles. On top of these are the historic redlining maps. You'll hear more about this in the Cleveland story. Enterprise is partnering with others to bring Undesign the Redline exhibits to a number of areas. Currently, the exhibit can be seen at the Los Angeles Trade Tech College, the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago Money Museum, and the Boston Architectural College. The exhibit has already been to Atlanta, Cleveland, Columbia, Maryland, Denver, New Orleans, and New York, to name a few cities. Check out Enterprise's website for more information about upcoming locations. For each of the cities Enterprise has partnered with Designing the We, we have created a digital archive of the maps housed in the resources section of Opportunity 360. Now I will turn the presentation over to Brayden to talk about designing the we and the impetus for the Undesign the Redline exhibit. Brayden? Okay, hi all. Can you, you hear me there? Um, thank you so much for having me on uh, to talk about this. It's really exciting. Uh, as Andy was mentioning, um, we are uh, all over right now with Enterprise in several different cities with the Undesign the Redline exhibit. And what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about the exhibit itself, kind of give a quick run through of some of the content that's in the exhibit, um, and wrap up kind of with uh, some possible next steps for folks on the webinar. So redlining uh, right, gets created as part of the New Deal. And so this is part of a redlining map that you're seeing here. This one particular one is a Brooklyn. but these maps are made for 239 different places and cities in the U.S. And the maps are essentially a risk assessment system that the federal government is creating uh, as part of the New Deal. So the federal government's getting involved in home ownership really for the first time at this moment. And we're, you know, inventing the 30-year mortgage, insuring home buyers, kind of in creating the American dream of owning your own home um, as a core piece of the American middle class. But, okay, the U.S. government, federal government, in the 1930s, right, is explicitly racist. And they're going to want to bake into these programs and policies ways to cut out people of color really from benefiting from them. And redlining is really how, one of the key ways we do that, in particular with home ownership and access to credit. So, you know, these are essentially a credit map. You know, this is before you and I would have an individual credit score. Uh, but 
Uh, these maps are essentially a credit score for your neighborhood. Your neighborhood would have a credit score. And everyone's going to get a color. You're either going to be green, which is great, definitely lend here, uh, blue, which is pretty good, yellow, which is considered declining, and finally red, which is where the term redlining comes from, which the federal government are going to call hazardous areas. Uh, too risky, really, to access credit. Um, and what this is going to do, you know, it starts with home loans, and there's a lot that precedes it, a lot that comes after, right? But this is focusing on home loans, but it really bleeds out into business loans, bank branch locations, um, insurance rates, et cetera. And so each place we, we bring these maps, right, you'll see uh, your local city's map and, and uh, possibly other cities, and you can see people have been pinning themselves up and interacting with that to see where they live. And right, what this is going to do <coughs> is send these areas that have been redlined into a path of decline and disinvestment because uh, you're going to have, have it f find it harder to buy a home, sell your house, get a mortgage, um, a bank loan, et cetera. And so these neighborhoods are going to kind of spiral into decline. And the question is, well, you know, why do that to an area, right? Well, each of these zones has what's called a corresponding area description. And so uh, if you look very carefully at this image, you'll see it says D8, C4, et cetera. And each of those has an area description. And the area description is going to tell us, well, why did you zone that area? So we have an area description here. This is for a D area. This is in the Bronx, but this is going to be using national language uh, that you'll find in almost every city. And you get down to line C there. It says detrimental influences Negro infiltration. Right, so these are going to be completely explicit. They're going to talk about hazardous social and racial groups, their presence in a place, and then also where they're quote unquote infiltrating or invading. And so this is particularly targeted towards black folks, but also includes Hispanic people, Asian people, at this point in time, new immigrant groups, um, Italian immigrants, Polish Czech immigrants, Jewish people, Right, people in the 1930s that are either new immigrants or people of color. And we're going to be targeting them and trying to track where they are to say that neighborhoods where these people are are going to become areas of disinvestment. And a big shift here is that although there might have been discrimination in lending before this, you know, if I was a black family, I might have trouble getting a loan. But now anyone around me who's in my same neighborhood is also going to have trouble. So that means this is going to spur things like white flight uh, from these red line areas um, as people are kind of fleeing this disinvestment. And it's going to create hypersegregation. So hypersegregation is getting worse through the 1930s and really accelerates after that as well. And so while that's happening on the one hand, right, on the one hand, we're concentrating folks into redlined areas at the same time that we're disinvesting and devaluing those areas. On the other hand, we're going to be, you know, opening up this massive spigot of wealth building and investment, which is for home ownership. So that's going to go to these green areas, green and blue areas. And um, th what the federal government's going to say is, okay, yeah, these green areas are where white people are living, but also that these are areas that have what they refer to as restrictions on hazardous infiltrators. And what that means is this area has a covenant that says this is a whites-only neighborhood or it's in the deed of the house to say you can't sell it to a black family or a Jewish family or an Asian family. And the federal government says that's good. That's what we want to see because by having these types of restrictions, you're preserving property value. And a handful of places in cities get green, right? Uh, in New York, it's the Upper East Side. You know, there's a handful of neighborhoods in Cleveland. But... For the most part, cities are more heterogeneous, and actually something like 70 or 80 percent of cities in the U.S. get red and yellow. And really yellow being declining is kind of like, well, this is going to become red. So, you know, what this is going to fuel, the areas that can have, right, this green are often going to be newer development, suburban areas, areas that can kind of wall themselves off and say, this is going to be a whites-only neighborhood. And what this means is over time, Redlining is going to fuel the production of an American geography, a geographic structure that we're all really used to in most cities across the U.S., which is concentrated areas of poverty in cities, mostly people of color, and much whiter, much wealthier suburbs that surround them. And that geography really gets designed by this system. And the second really big outcome of this is going to be, of course, on wealth. 
So this produces a massive racial wealth gap um, and, and entrenches it. It makes it much worse, in fact. And so, you know, this is still a huge, huge wealth gap today, very much so influenced by this. Why? One, because, uh, you know, wealth is intergenerational. So what's happening back here is going to ripple forward. And two, of course, the number one mechanism for wealth in the United States has been home ownership. And we're really going to cut people out of that opportunity. Um, and even those who may have owned homes in redlined areas, right, they're not going to become the asset that you build family wealth with. They're, they're going to lose value, right, become, go underwater uh, and become uh, uh, something that we, is no longer valuable. And so the introduction to the exhibit is looking at, right, just this, which are what is redlining? You know, that it was this credit system for homes, that it was explicitly racist, that there's no gray area here. We are very explicit about it. And that it really produced this geography and wealth gap that we still live today with today. So the premise of the exhibit, right, being redlining is one of the policies where we really design racism into the American landscape. And it's never been undone, right? It's, we've never taken it back out again. And we look at the local maps for each area, so you can see, and the local area descriptions as well. The next part of the exhibit is really the centerpiece, which is this timeline. And this is just two of those panels, there's four, that kind of looks back before redlining uh, through you know, things like reconstruction, the Great Migration, right? The Great Migration, as folks are fleeing the South, fleeing racial terrorism in the South, and, and really all over the country, we were just in LA, uh, and looking at um, the huge prominence of the KKK in Los Angeles at, uh, during the 19-teens and 20s. Well, that, folks are going to get concentrated into redlined areas through the Great Migration, and it's also going to fuel things like this fear around invasion and infiltration. Um, but this, I'll t step you through a little bit of what's on this timeline. Um, so after we get done with redlining, uh, that we've, we've kind of implemented that and we start moving forward, we get into this era, right, where for some we're building value, right? We have Levittown here, famous first suburbs, right? Uh, home ownership, uh, after World War II, GI Bill, these types of policies that are really building wealth and value for some people. Well, on the other hand, we're really destroying wealth and value for other folks. So in the bottom left here, you see, uh, you know, the beginnings of urban renewal, um, the building of the Cross Bronx Expressway, right? We're going to destroy neighborhoods there. Um, on the right, bottom right, you can see pictures from St. Louis, okay, where we're going to um, do things like slum clearance, right? Where we're going to say, well, now we have this slum problem. Uh, we don't know why, but guess what? The answer is we need to bulldoze these neighborhoods. So, you know, all over the country, you know, they, they refer to slums as, quote, unquote, a cancer on the city. And, you know, what do you do with a tumor? You remove it. So we're going to bulldoze these neighborhoods. In the center here is a paragraph, and this is actually from a real estate textbook. And this is from private real estate industry. So if you're going to be a realtor, you'll be tested on this. This language predates redlining, but it also is going to roll forward at least until the 1968 Fair Housing Act. And I'll just read this for you. It says, the colored people certainly have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but they must recognize the economic disturbance which their presence in a white neighborhood causes and forgo their desire to split off from the established district where the rest of their race lives. Right, so we're not mincing any words here. We're, we're really gonna talk about this economic process. They refer to that as the property value argument, meaning if you're a good realtor, you're gonna protect the property values of your clients, and this is how. And so, you know, this type of explicit language, as I said, by the 1968 Fair Housing Act certainly will, you, it's not something you would find that by then. But of course, this mentality is going to predominate in real estate for a very long time, even today. So this is going to get us into this era of, quote unquote, urban decay, uh, urban crisis, you know, which starts, which really takes off by the 1970s, late 60s, and, you know, in many places is still ongoing. Um, right, where now we have this massive amount of disinvestment uh, at the same time that we trap people. And then you get programs like planned shrinkage, where cities are going to say, listen, we don't have enough money for everybody, 
So we have to identify parts of our cities that are quote unquote dying, read areas that got redlined, and parts in the city are quote unquote healthy, you know, read areas that didn't get redlined. And we're going to sacrifice those dying neighborhoods to save money for the wealthy neighborhoods. And so we're going to cut off trash pickup, street maintenance, schools, parks, libraries. Uh, in fact, the very first thing to get cut, and it's during the uh, financial crisis of uh, the uh, New York City almost going bankrupt in 76, is fire departments. They're going to cut fire departments. And it's the very first smart cities program ever implemented uh, is to cut fire departments. And everywhere that happens is going to burn. So in places, you know, here you have a picture of Jimmy Carter touring parts of the South Bronx where over a period of about 10 years, you have 80% of the built environment literally burned to the ground. And this is going to start up ep epidemics, right? So you get epidemic fires and a blight and abandonment, epidemic unemployment. The nation's first heroin epidemic, right, is going to slip through and, and enter these neighborhoods. You know, now we're in the second modern heroin epidemic, talked about as a uh, health care crisis. Well, this is going to be talked about as a criminal crisis. And so you start getting reactions like broken windows pol policing, which is to say, look, we need to clean up the city. Um, you know, we need to fix things up. And the way that we're going to do that is by cracking down. And so in many ways, you know, to get things like mass incarceration really arising out of this context. At the same time, right, that that's happening in kind of a top-down way, you do have a community organizing movement, community gardens, community churches, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act, right? You have a ground-up movement to say, hey, the, what we need to do is rebuild community, right? But these two things kind of clash in many ways in their approach. And that leads us up until today, right? When you have the quote-unquote cleaning up of certain neighborhoods and you have investment pouring back into redlined areas in many places across the country, uh, really for the first time since they were redlined. So you either have the situation really being trapped and still deadlocked or uh, the neighborhood's getting flipped. And there's very little in between. And this is, you know, we know because of this history, right, we're not going to see uh, folks who've been on the front lines of redlining uh, benefit. You're going to see a lot of a displacement and housing crisis and the things that we're dealing with now. And in many ways, you can't get to that without redlining, right? Because Redlining is going to artificially devalue real estate, which then makes it prime for speculation and flipping. And so you see gentrification happening primarily in redlined areas. And, you know, one thing that we often talk about is that, one, you know, we don't look at this larger context. So something that seems like an immediate crisis is actually part of this much, much bigger uh, longer term system. And, and two, many of the crises we're dealing with in today or in one era often originate from crises prior, right? So slum clearance is an answer to the slum problem, planned shrinkage and answer to the uh, budget crisis, and then, you know, things like mass incarceration and so forth. I'll respond to that. So the last thing I just want to run short on time here, but I wanted to talk about, you know, we the importance of understanding this history is extremely critical because without understanding that, we really don't know what to do next. But it's also really important to focus on what comes next. You know, many of the things that reason we created this exhibit, because many of the outcomes that Andy mentioned earlier, right, housing, mobility, economic, security, health, right, are all entangled in this history. So as we move forward, we have to understand this history. And then the three steps that I'll just mention as I wrap up here, you know, we talk about reframing. So narrative change, uh, creating spaces to have this conversation regularly, to reflect on our own work, right, and, and change the conversation, redesign thinking about not only what new models and opportunities that we have, but what are the systems of design? How can we make design, community development, things like this, the process more democratic? And of course, uh, we talk about reinvest. So what are the, what are the local economies? Well, how do we really do, look at things like wealth building and ownership and um, really creating thriving places together um, as we move forward? So I'm going to end it there. Um, I've got one more slide here just thinking about that. Some of the things that we're talking about, how does this data, like what you'll see in Opportunity 360, fit into all of this? How can we use that to create new projects and engage with people? It's very key. So you can definitely uh, email me if you're interested. We'll be sending that stuff out. And um, check out the hashtag Undesign the Red Line to learn more. Um, and we're happy to bring it to your town as well. That was one thing that they wanted me to mention. So send me a note. And thank you for having me on the on here. 
Thank you so much, Braden. Next, we're going to get the Cleveland story from starting with Elizabeth Richards from Enterprises Ohio office. Elizabeth? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Elizabeth Richards with um, the Enterprise Ohio office. I'm a senior program director, and we're excited to tell you about the Cleveland story here. Um, just really briefly, in 2018, Enterprise Ohio celebrated its 30th anniversary, where we were a legacy office for Enterprise and were an early outpost supported by Jim Rouse. Um, to date, in Ohio, in this great state, we've invested $870 million through grants, loans, and financing, and locally in Cleveland. Cleveland and Cuyahoga County through two signature initiatives. We've developed the 710 supportive housing units for the chronically homeless population here. And we're looking forward to ending chron functional chronic homelessness in the near future. We've also returned more than $144 million to households through the Earned Income Tax Credit Coalition, which we are a local lead for. In 2018, Really, three factors led us to embrace the opportunity to host and design in Cleveland. One was our local commitment to racial equity and inclusion. Two, we were fresh off of a multi-year, multi-sector, citywide racial equity training led by our sister intermediary, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, and you'll hear from them in a moment. And three, we were actually engaged at a program level around the work of bringing capital back into disinvested neighborhoods, specifically Cleveland. Cleveland's east side neighborhoods. For those of you not familiar with Cleveland, we have a very solid community development infrastructure here and a strong history of collaboration, including CDCs, intermediaries, civic, and philanthropic, excuse me, philanthropic philanthropic partners, um, and given Cleveland Neighborhood Progress's incredible leadership on the issue of race and equity, it really made sense for us to support them in taking the lead on design in Cleveland. So, Erica, over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar. Uh, shout out to Braden and the Designing We team, um, as well as Enterprise. Really appreciate the partnership uh, that we have. Um, so just briefly, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress is a 30-year-old funding intermediary here based in the city of Cleveland. Um, we are funded, founded by our funders, the Cleveland Foundation, the George Gunn Foundation, as well as the Mort Mendel Foundation. Um, so we've been doing this work quite some time most of which uh, in partnership with Enterprise Community Partners. Next slide, please. So as Elizabeth noted, uh, we at Neighborhood Progress have been working diligently um, towards racial equity and inclusion. And uh, what you see on your screen here, just a couple of highlights of where we see the synergy of this work with um, not only the Undesign the Red Line exhibit, but also with the Opportunity 360 maps. Um, we very much look at our work as people, uh, not just people in place, but people in place and just really understanding the intersection of community economic development from the lens and the perspective of the people that live and are comprised in our neighborhoods. Um, particularly thinking about the historical and the institutional structural racism that has occurred in our nation and we heard um, really good information from Braden. We saw that there was great synergy in our path uh, to undo some of these systems that have been in place for quite some time, as well as policies, um, and how that dovetails nicely with this exhibit. Um, and then further, um, understanding not just the historical context, but how these issues, um, unfortunately, keep coming up today. Um, they resurface in ways that um, represent uh, continued issues and things like lead poisoning, infant mortality, disparity in our educational systems, things like that. Um, and then lastly, just to highlight that um, we view and, and truly feel that this work cannot be done unless you're approaching it from a multidimensional standpoint as well as with multidimensional partners. Next slide. Um, so for a more in-depth uh, overview of our racial equity work, I would recommend you going to clevelandnp.org uh, backslash REI. Um, but what you see here is just a couple of highlights of our work and our journey. So we've been on this journey and offering uh, the training, film screenings, book screenings, uh, our book discussions, as well as now with the exhibit since fall of 2016. Um, and as you can see, of the folks that have gone through our racial equity training, which is hosted by the Racial Equity Institute of Greensboro, North Carolina, a um, little over half of the participants that have gone through that training are white. Um, we've had just over 3,100 individuals participate in one of the two trainings, which is about 700 organizations here in the greater Cleveland area that have participated. Most of those organizations represent the nonprofit sector. 
Um, so really just a, a full-on um, commitment from our community to really try to understand how we can begin to undo these systems. Um, so our work with uh, Braden and Enterprise began last year. Um, Braden came out to uh, bear the cold of Ohio and uh, with along with one of his partners, we viewed the city of Cleveland, we toured it with him, um, and one of the neighborhoods that we brought Braden to was the Mount Pleasant neighborhood, which is located in the southeast side of the city of Cleveland. Um, our partner now, uh, we were sort of in discussion at that time, but Nick Perry, the executive director of Mount Pleasant Now Community Development Corporation, um, was really enthused after meeting Braden and learning about the interactive exhibit. Um, and pretty much just raised his hand and said, hey, I'm ready to jump on board with you all and help to bring this exhibit to Cleveland. Um, so that is where uh, we began that conversation uh, last year. And then officially in the fall of 2018, we launched the exhibit um, at the Mount Pleasant Now CDC. Next slide, please. Since launching uh, in the fall of 2016, uh, the way in which we have engaged folks here in our community a couple of different ways. Um, Mount Pleasant Now is a, is a free and accessible space that individuals can come in and out um, in a fluid nature. Um, so folks can come in at any time and participate in a self-guided tour on their own. Um, but in addition to that, we have two offerings to the residents and folks here in the greater Cleveland area. Uh, we have tour guides that are stationed at the exhibit at select times throughout the week. Um, so individuals can come and have a personal tour guide lead them through the exhibit. And what has been really, really popular, I would say, is the private tours. Um, so we offer this to the community for groups uh, around 15 or more um, so that they have a little bit more of an intimate experience. In that case, um, we often have had boards come through, um, committees, um, representing pretty much every sector you can think of. We've had folks from uh, youth schools, so schools, um, youth-oriented organizations, uh, phil phil philanthropic organizations, um, as well as a, an array of nonprofit, um, as well as some government partners that have come through. Um, and those look a little different for each entity that comes through. Some want to have the facilitated dialogue as we're going through the tour. Others prefer to have that structured after they go through the tour um, and then have a more intimate conversation as it pertains to their specific organization or the sector um, that they represent. Next slide. Um, and these are just a couple of images. Uh, LaShawn is one of our superstar uh, tour guides, a resident of the neighborhood, um, also um, represents another CDC, the Union Mile CDC, just up the road from this one, um, leading some folks through the tour. So to round out before I had to, uh, turn it back over to Elizabeth, um, just a quick pictorial of sort of where we see the intersections of all this work. Um, we really really feel this is assembling the building blocks to undesign the red line. So our year of awareness, which began in 2016, Opportunity 360, which came online to us, or to, to the world, I guess, uh, in 2017, and then the launch of the exhibit in 2018. All of these are building blocks um, really to put us on this path to begin to undesign the red line. Um, and while we um, have not yet come across the 10 steps to eradicate ra racism in America, uh, we do feel like we are building those blocks. Um, if anyone does have those 10 steps, please shoot me an email. We'd greatly appreciate it. Um, but we really feel that the year of awareness building, the Opportunity 360, and this Undesigned the Red Line are the essential elements that will lead us on a path um, to where we know we deserve our community to be and what those that are living in it um, deserve as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Elizabeth for us to dig into our local Opportunity 360 map. Thanks, Erica. Really quickly, and we'll toggle one more time to Cleveland Neighborhood Progress before we head to Denver. Just want to show that um, in terms of the Opportunity 360 uh, mapping. We um, focused on a, a couple of things here, as Andy Masters indicated at the opening of the webinar. Um, and I want to just take a moment to pause here before we look at the maps to show that on the left, this is the legend essentially to what we mapped. You have um, the key indicators um, based on the Opportunity 360 Index, housing stability, education, health, wellness, economic security, and mobility. And then in the middle, in terms of what you we actually mapped, you have the data categories, so housing stability, we looked at home ownership, housing cost burden, housing affordability, 
for education, we looked at high school completion and higher education attainment. Health and well-being, we looked at access and affordability of health care and health status of residents in these areas. For economic security, we looked at income, poverty rates, employment, and then lastly, with mobility, we were looking at transit. So looking at the first map here, I want to, before we, we go into some detail, um, pause to re-describe what we're looking at. So it, the, the overall area is Cuyahoga County, and um, you can't, the legend is very small, but the bottom um, on the left-hand side, red and yellow indicate hazardous and declining areas. Green and blue areas indicate, the red, the, the lined areas indicate desirable and best. Um, and if, if you look at this map, what you essentially see is that, as we've referenced earlier, the, the red and yellow lining describes the city of Cleveland. So in a, a greater county area, the areas that show up as most problematic, according to the red line maps, our Cleveland proper. The maps we used were from 1940. And what is interesting to note um, at, a, at a macro level is that in 1950, shortly after these maps were produced, Cleveland met, um, experienced its highest population count, so 914,000 in 1950. From that point forward, however, um, the the population of Cleveland City proper declined. So for the past 70 years, um, every decade, a decline in population to a point today where we have under 400,000. So that's one way to really understand how redlining has affected cities like Cleveland. We are looking at the education map. So we'll show you five. The three uh, we'll spend a little uh, more time on just because you do see a real correlation between the mapping and the redlining. In this map, you'll see the lighter colors indicate poorer measures and poorer outcomes. The darker colors indicate better, higher scores, and better outcomes. And here you can very clearly see a relationship to the lighter areas and the red and yellow lined areas. An example here is that graduation rates between the red and yellow areas would be 72% in urban schools, and then the green and blue areas just to the east here uh, would have 90 to 98% graduation rates. In the health and well-being mapping, you can also see, again, the lighter pink areas where you have more problematic outcomes and the darker pink areas outside in the outer line areas. An example here would be health disparities um, in terms of life expectancy. In the red and yellow neighborhoods of Cleveland City proper, the average age of life ex expectancy is 65 to 66. In just to the east, in the blue and green areas, the average uh, life expectancy age is 88. So um, great disparity there. Last, in terms of the, the maps where you see a real, um, again, correlation between the light and dark, in the light areas here, um, we are showing outcomes for income, poverty rates, and employment. And again, in the darker outer line areas of the county, you have better outcomes. An example with the poverty rate would be that in Cleveland, you have a 36% poverty rate in those red and yellow areas, and in the county, it's much lower um, in, the, in the teens. The transit mapping here is a little uh, less clear, partly because you actually do have access to transit in the city, but you do still see some correlation. And then lastly, I'll wrap up here on the housing stability map where, again, it's a little bit of a less clear correlation because the indicators we're mapping are have to do with home ownership rates, and Cleveland is a city with quite a few in-city uh, single-family homes and home ownership um, does occur, unlike in other cities where you have more of a multifamily stock. And then we do have uh, affordability issues here in the sense that uh, we, in many areas, have very declined housing stock and some of the housing is very affordable. So with that, I will wrap up and turn it over to Cleveland Neighborhood Progress to bring us in for a landing. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so, once again, my name is Devontae Dickey. I'm the Advocacy and Engagement Coordinator here at Cleveland Neighborhood Progress. And once again, I just want to say thank you for participating in this webinar. Uh, for, the duration, for, uh, for, the portion, for the duration of this portion of the webinar, excuse me, I, as long, along with my colleague Erica, will be discussing several topics. The first, 
I will discuss the significant findings and themes that surface as community residents and organizations engage with the exhibit. Secondly, I will explain how the Opportunity 360 maps continue to enhance the undesigned the red line experience. Thirdly, I will expound on Clevelanders' experience, the impressions, as well as the local responses that we are receiving. And then lastly, I will touch on how the undesigned the red line work continues to influence Cleveland's work, um, as well as in the community as well. Next slide, please. So on your screen, you see um, th these are only two of the many organizations um, that ha are continuing to engage with the exhibit. So of course, to your left, you have a member of Phil Philanthropy Ohio um, examining the third section of the exhibit. And of course, to your right, you see two teachers that are part of the City Year Program engaging. And of course, throughout our facilitated dialogues and as community organizers and members continue to engage with the exhibit, two words continue, continue um, to surface. And the two words are um, undescribable and powerful. Um, and that is all to say that the undesigned, the red line experience um, are those two things. Next slide, please. And so on your screen now, the question that I want to pose is, what are the significant findings as community, communities engage with the exhibit? So on your screen, you should see six of the many things that um, we are continuing to gather from our um, facilitated dialogue. First, most people have not learned about the pervasive and explicit government sanctioned policies that were enacted in the early 1930s. Second is the value of the lived experience. We acknowledge that the exhibit provides an environment for those who are unfortunately still experiencing a form of redlining today. The exhibit provides a sense of validation that the challenges, trials, and barriers that they currently face are in fact by design. Next is the importance of historical contextual contextualization. Um, once again, the historical context provided by the exhibit as a revisionist historic lens um, to the topic of redlining. And because of that, participants are often flabbergasted when the true realities of our American history are revealed. Next, um, while redlining pertains to housing, we can draw synergies with the issues such as racial wealth gap, lead poisoning, voter suppression, digital redlining, food deserts, and of course, a panoply, a panoply of other residual effects. And of course, lastly, the last two that I want to emphasize is that the Undesigned the Red Line exhibit brings up the importance of both youth engagement as well as the Opportunity 360 maps um, elevate and connect the policies of the past to the issues of today. Additionally, the Opportunity 360 maps provide um, proofs of participants that the uh, Red Line is still manifest today. Thank you. And of course, on your screen, um, you see all three amazing quotes that highlight, um, that highlight the community feedback um, and reception that we are receiving. And I highly recommend just taking a look at it. And of course, lastly, um, I just want to say that um, lastly, for, for us, one critical element on this path to undesigning the red line is acknowledgement of the role of power. We believe that the building blocks, such as the Year of Awareness, Undesigned the Red Line, and Opportunity 360 are critical to achieving equitable civic engagement and change in our communities. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you, everybody from Cleveland. Um, next, we're going to turn things over to Katie McKenna from Enterprise in Denver to talk about the Denver story and how the exhibit unfolded there. Katie? Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here today with you. I'm Katie McKenna, and I'm a senior program director at the Enter at Enterprise in the Denver market. Um, and as I've been listening, one of the things that I just love about Undesign the Red Line and Opportunity 360 is we use the same tools, uh, but they take on such a different life and different meaning in different communities. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about how that looks in Denver. Uh, so. I would um, like to cover, hold on one second while I get my slides together. Pardon me. I can't think and talk at the same time. All right, there we go. Um, uh, I'll, I'll share a little bit about um, 
Denver, uh, the Enterprise Office in Denver, our goals around advancing racial equity, about how Undesign the Red Line and Opportunity 360 have helped us move this fo work forward and lay the foundation for what we hope is to come in the future. I'll share a little bit of information about partners and events and educational opportunities that have developed as a result of Undesign the Red Line. And uh, one of our partners, uh, Rowena Legria, uh, will be joining us as well to tell to talk about her program, the I Am Denver Storytelling Lab, which is a really powerful um, program and enhancement to the Undesign the Red Line exhibit here in Denver. At a little bit of background about our view on racial equity. Um, we look at racial equity both as a practice and, and how we do our work and how we engage with communities, but also an outcome that we're looking for in which race does not predict one success. Um, obviously, as uh, we heard from Cleveland and, and other places around the country, we know we're far from that goal, but think it's important to lay that out as, as our priority for where we're going. Um, so we're looking at uh, racial equity uh, from the standpoint that when we achieve this goal, it improves outcomes for all. It's not just for people who have historically been impacted by redlining or uh, people who are threatened by gentrification or at risk of involuntary displacement. It's for all of us. Um, we know that it's going to take systems change to accomplish this work, and it's uh, central to our efforts here in Denver. Um, we're working on policy solutions, financial solutions, uh, programmatic solutions, and something that has been really important for us uh, is to be able to lay the foundation and provide education. Um, as Devonta said, a lot of our um, just general population here in Denver, we've gotten a lot of feedback that uh, we didn't know a lot about the history of redlining in Denver, um, and so that education has been a really important part, a really important piece of the puzzle for us. Um, so both Undesign the Red Line and Opportunity 360 have been important tools to help us talk about racial equity, to help us make plans for the future, and we see it in a lot of ways as really a foundation for our systems change here in Denver, um, tools that have grounded us in history and data and create a solid foundation for discussion and planning and action for the future. At Enterprise, we look at um, access to opportunity through the lens of having a safe and affordable home. Um, we believe that success starts at home, and it's a home that, that a family or individual can afford is really critical to all of that. Uh, we also know that families who don't have a stable and affordable home, uh, they move more frequently, and frequent moves ha can seriously jeopardize a child's academic success. Um, Last year, uh, 42,000 people were living primarily, or 42,000 students were living primarily on the streets during the school year. And we know that too many families nationwide and locally here in Denver struggle to make ends meet because their rent burden is just so high. Um, it's no surprise that uh, a severely, severely cost burdened family uh, who has kids, uh, they spend about two, $200 less on food every month than families who are paying 30% of their income for their rent or less. Um, so we understand these issues as really critical to the opportunity that families are accessing and the outcomes of kids into the future. Uh, so Undesign the Red Line and Opportunity 360 has helped us learn and map that people of color in Denver have less access to opportunity and they're more likely to be housing burdened. They're more likely to experience housing instability and less likely to own a home. Uh, people of color also have lower incomes, uh, they have worse health outcomes, and we know that at the heart of all of this, uh, quality housing really matters, and so do quality neighborhoods who ha with access to opportunity. So looking at uh, the history, the data, and the maps, we've really been able to understand these racial disparities that still exist today in Denver. 
if you are in Denver, I encourage you to come see the Undesign the Red Line exhibit. Uh, it is currently at the McNichols building, um, and the official opening is on Monday, um, but if you go visit there now, it is all set up um, so you can see it uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, it'll be at the McNichols building through the end of May. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Denver area, you, here is our redlining map. This was really one of our favorite parts about the exhibit. Visitors place pins on the map to indicate where they live, where they have lived in the past, where their family lives. It's a really interactive part of the exhibit, a, a great introduction, and it helps visitors think spatially, um, think about where on the map they live so that they can understand their experience in the context of the maps that they see later in the exhibit. Um, one of, we, got, we get so much positive feedback about the, the map and how it, it really helps people think about Denver spatially and think about where, where, they, where an individual visitor fits in the puzzle. Um, in Denver, we worked with uh, Shift Research Labs and Opportunity 360 to overlay uh, some of Denver's opportunity indicators and demographics with the redlining maps of our past. And we, it, something very interesting rose to the surface, um, and it's been very relevant to our work. So this upside down L shape uh, shows up on almost every map that we see and gives us uh, some really key insights into the city. This L is important because uh, it gives us clues about access to opportunity and where disparities might be. Um, if you also remember from the slide before, it uh, overlays uh, very closely with areas that have been redlined in the past. So outside of the upside down L, those are areas, and this is a generalization, but those are areas that have been redlined and inside the L were areas that were not uh, redlined. Um, so where you live uh, in this context is not just about the roof over your head. It's about um, the context of your neighborhood, uh, both in the past and also today. So looking at a few other maps, uh, race and place both matter a whole lot in Denver. This exhibit and the Opportunity 360 data um, that we looked at help us see really clearly and articulate the disparities that we see in the city. So outside the L, these are areas um, that have been flanked by industry, by smelters, by, um, in Denver we have a Purina pet food plant and highways. Um, and they have gradually become places that have been less desirable to live. Um, pollution and noise are high, air quality is lower, um, and if people could afford it and they were uh, allowed to, they moved further away from these things or into the center of the L. Um, this is important because it's it tells us that it's not just a series of coincidences that have created the disparities in certain parts of town. It tells us that there's systemic racism that's at the root of these disparities, and we can see it really clearly on the maps. You can see where um, there's a less, a less white population on the outside of the L, a more color, a more white population on the inside of the L, um, fewer trees on the outside. People are more likely uh, to be involuntary involuntarily displaced because of gentrification and neighborhood change on the outside of the L. Um, one of the thing, one of the pieces of the conversation that has been uh, very relevant and connecting back to uh, the history of redlining in in Denver has been the conversation about gentrification and involuntary displacement. In, uh, the, in 2000, the city of Denver was about 52% uh, white, not Hispanic, uh, according to our census then. And now it's about 54% white, not Hispanic. Now that might seem like not that big of a deal, but it is important in the context of as we see the demographics of our city changing um, and see that it is primarily people of color who are leaving, that's something that's really important for us to, really important for us to pay attention to. Um, Undesigned the Red Line gave 
uh, visitors and our partners uh, the opportunity to interact with the experience and make their to interact with the exhibit and make their thoughts part of the permanent exhibit and it put into context uh, the historical data and gave us a way to collect uh, the thoughts and ideas and questions that people were having as they went through the exhibit. Um, we, all, we used the Opportunity Framework uh, as we were using, looking at the upside down L. We have maps um, that are very similar um, to the maps that we saw from, that Elizabeth shared in Cleveland, uh, where we're mapping opportunity and looking at it in the context of historical redlining. And then uh, lastly, partnership has been core to everything that we've done um, at Enterprise uh, as part of this exhibit, uh, certainly, um, but as part of all of the work that we do. We're really proud to be able to bring uh, people to, to the table, and we're also thankful for the many funders and investors and community leaders, legislators, and many more who joined us uh, for this exhibit and will continue to join uh, as, as it's open in Denver. Um, while the exhibit was open, we hosted meetings and events, and our partners also hosted meetings and events. Uh, some of them were uh, Wells Fargo Community Conversations, Habitat for Humanity hosted an inclusivity event, Mile High Connects hosted their Anchor, Anchor Network, um, our Department of Public Health, uh, we co-hosted a health and housing convening, and uh, a group called Creative Strategies for Change had a community voice event. Um, we know that as we see these racial disparities on the maps, we want to be able to bring people together so that we can work to undesign the red line, um, which is why one of our most special partners was the I Am Denver Storytelling Lab. We really think that the community voice is so important as part of this. So the Storytelling Lab has given uh, dozens of Denverites, uh, including our mayor, a platform to talk about their experience, and we're happy uh, that Rowena Alegria was able to join us on the webinar um, to share a little bit more about, um, about that event. Rowena, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Katie, and hello, everybody. Um, I am Rowena Alegria. I'm Chief Storyteller for the City and County of Denver. We are actually officially launching this project tomorrow. And I had a bunch of cool slides and some stories to show you that we have collected so far, but um, we were having some technical difficulties, so I'm not going to be able to do that. But I will just give you an overview of how the program works. Um, we started out on this project when um, there were so many walkouts by students and by people across the country with regard to race and justice, and the mayor was out uh, meeting with community to, to have those conversations. Um, an outgrowth of that was a project we called Denver Talks, where we invited residents across the city to read the book Citizen and American Lyric by Claudia Rankin, and then join us for 66 separate conversations across the city and the opportunity to talk about racial microaggressions and personal bias and those kinds of things. Um, our expectation was that, you know, folks would need to warm up to the idea and to sharing their stories. and. We found that that absolutely was not the case, that people had stories that they wanted to share. I come from journalism, and I was the mayor's communications director, and my current role, or before the chief storyteller role, was a senior advisor for community communications, charged with finding ways to reach um, particularly underserved and underrepresented populations, and be able to provide information to them and develop a loop of conversation with them, of communication with them, so that they were um, hearing from us, but that we were hearing from them. Um, meanwhile, I'd been enamored of Humans of New York. If you haven't checked that out, I highly recommend it. Um, it was begun by a photographer who just went out and decided he was gonna take pictures of 10,000 New Yorkers. He wound up taking pictures and telling stories, and it's, I mean, he has millions of followers now and books and has done these kinds of stories around the world, including some of the most impactful reporting on the Syrian refugee crisis that I've seen um, for the reason that it was focused on the people and not the politics or the policies, but the people. 
Um, so I also met the chief storyteller for Detroit. And what they're doing is a storytelling model, but they, it's really a, a newspaper model where they're, although it's, you know, the stories are posted online, but it's, you know, primarily photos and stories. And my thought was, let's combine all of these things and create a format that um, engages community from the city perspective, first and foremost, that um, invites people to come in and culturally preserves um, people's stories and their cultures in, you know, neighborhoods that have changed dramatically and rapidly in a very short period of time. Um, and how we're doing that is, is this slide. Um, people can submit their stories. They can nominate stories that should be told, and they don't just have to be about people. They can be about, for example, a restaurant that's celebrating its 50-year anniversary this year. It can be about um, the people who took themselves out of their wheelchairs and laid down in one of Denver's busiest streets um, in an effort that led to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, they can join us at these storytelling labs, which we're partnering with con community organizations to, um, to host, where people can come in, they get a little inspiration and instruction, we help them um, find their story and then refine their story and then give them the opportunity to record it. And then we share it and we're sharing it on a website where we have a robust um, social media campaign and we are working toward doing presentations with the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, with Lighthouse Writers Workshop, with a number of our, of our partners to um, make sure that the stories get out and they get told. So, um, I'm really sad that I can't share these videos with you because um, it really is a, a beautiful community engagement effort. I've never experienced this level of engagement. For example, we, with Undesign the Red Line, we hosted a presentation of I Am Denver stories that were collected at the lab at the um, Undesign the Red Line's first location. And then when we moved it into a city building, we shared, we did a presentation as the kickoff and shared some of the stories. And I invited everybody who'd participated, 10 people said they would come, 10 people showed up, which for those of you who work in city government, that's amazing. And then, you know, 40, 50, 60 people in the audience, they stayed and they listened. And some of these stories were great. Some of them weren't very good at all. And people laughed and they cried and they shared um, in this amazing event. Um, for the kickoff tomorrow, I invited a bunch of folks and even those, especially those who came to our lab, still the need to tell me whether they're coming or not coming um, to our event. And I feel like we just have established an entirely new level of engagement through this project and through giving voice to our residents. So um, please check us out um, as of tomorrow, imdenver.com and follow us uh, at uh, hashtag I am Denver, and yes, it's not working today because we literally launch all of it tomorrow. So please find us there. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Rowena, and thank you to all of our presenters. Unfortunately, with the technical difficulties, we weren't able to share the videos. However, we will be emailing them out with the archive email, so you'll have links to all of our video, all of the videos that Rowena would have shared today, um, and we'll also be tweeting those out. So please be on the lookout for those. But I want to thank all of our presenters for giving their time, and I want to thank everybody that hanged through the webinar. Um, Come back and see us at opportunity360.org. Um, email us at opportunity360 at enterprisecommunity.org. Thanks, and see you next time.